Um, I would like to introduce our first speaker. I have a fine introduction for you. Professor John Sweeney has been at Maynooth University Geography Department since 1978. He's originally from Glasgow and received his BSc and PhD from the University of Glasgow. John has taught courses primarily related to climatology, but he's also taught biogeography, geomorphology, and environmental resource management, and has taught and researched at a number of universities in North America and Africa. He's also been involved in course design and curriculum development matters at second and third levels. Over the past 38 years, he's published approximately 100 scientific papers and edited and co-authored four texts on various aspects of climatology and climate change in Ireland. He's served a number of national academic societies as president, secretary and treasurer, as well as being the Irish representative on a number of European <coughs> academic bodies. He's also led a number of nationally funded research projects examining various aspects of climate change in Ireland. Professor Sweeney contributed to the reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. Now, he's just said to me he's not a Nobel Peace Prize winner, but he did get a plaque, so that was... <laughs> um, John is outgoing president of Ontashka, the National Trust of Ireland. Thanks very much. I'll use, I'll use this one. To see Thanks very much. Uh, I hardly recognise myself, but um, despite the accent, um, my own roots are, are just in the adjoining county to the north of us here, so it's a pleasure uh, to come down to the west of Ireland at any opportunity, and I'm thankful to the Hedford Environment Group for inviting me. Um, when I come to the west of Ireland, I'm always thinking about uh, the poet Seamus Heaney, who spent so much of his time wandering around, and uh, there's a very apt um, little quote from him here, which I, I don't think you'll be able to see if you're sitting beyond the third row, unfortunately, but feel free to come up to the front, if you like, where there's plenty of space. Um, and it is that the, the world where we are to make our tarry arc lies before us. And it's a kind of a, a, I suppose, a watchword for what we're, we're trying to do um, today in, in looking at the, the kind of world we're shaping for the future, both for our own children and for the people that come after us. And it's a sense of how are we determining the legacy of what we leave behind uh, for them to have uh, opportunities and have options for the future. What we do know is, of course, that we live in a warming world, and as we work our way through from the end of the 19th century, you'll see how those colours change to uh, yellows and oranges as the world has warmed up considerably uh, over the past century. And we know also that last year, therefore, ranked as the, the warmest year since at least 1880, when reliable scientific records of climate uh, became available. But one in interesting statistic for, for any of you who are under the age of 30 in the room, uh, and that is that uh, throughout your life, you've never experienced a month uh, in your existence when the Earth's temperature was colder than the whole of the 20th century average. So we live in very exceptional times, therefore. Um, and these exceptional times are not just exceptional for us, they're exceptional uh, especially for those who can ill afford to cope with the extra stresses and strains which uh, is being imposed upon them uh, by climate change. And I, I particularly like this, this image of this African lady because I'm not really sure what she's trying to tell us. Uh, is she saying, uh, look at the life you've given me here, uh, I have to walk 15 kilometres to get my firewood for my evening meal, I carry my baby on my, on, on my back as I do? Or is she saying, you know, I'm independent, I'm going to be able to cope, I just need a little help in life? And that kind of image <coughs> haunted me for a, a long time last year. Um, and uh, eventually I got to Africa and I went into a very small, uh, isolated little place in the middle of the bush in Zimbabwe to talk to some of the local people in a village hall, not unlike this. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, it was made of, of mud and, and wood. And uh, the local people... Uh, then began to tell me their story. And I'm always interested in talking sometimes to the, the elder people in, in the area because they have the longest memory. So I fastened on this old man here and uh, I asked him about how was he managing these days. And he said, well, 
things have changed very much for me because I used to be able to go out and plant my corn uh, in, in September and then the rains would come in October and November and, and I'd be able to grow my crop and enough food for my family. I'd go out and harvest it then after the turn of the year. But he said, the last few years, things have changed so dramatically. Uh, I go out and plant my crop and the rains don't come or they're very late and my crop sometimes disappears uh, and shrivels up uh, and doesn't germinate. Or even if it does grow, I go out after the end of the year to harvest it and the rains have withdrawn early and my crop dries up in the field as well. And although he didn't ask me the question, the question on his lips were very clear. Um, he was more or less saying, well, what's going on? Who's responsible for that? And here, you know, I was at a loss because I had to tell him, well, it's, I'm afraid it's us in the developed world that's really the major cause of your problems at the moment. And to confirm his problems, I went a little further to see in that part of Zambia, the famous Victoria Falls, where the great Zambezi pours over um, the, the escarpment. Uh, it flows down uh, into Lake Kariba, the largest man-made body of water on Earth where it powers the great hydro turbines, which give something like 90% of the electricity of, of the big country of Zambia. And that's how it looked in June last year. Um, but I was there, not in June, I was there in September. And this is how it looked in September. Um, and, and I was really horrified to see that, that the water had gone, um, the uh, rains had failed, uh, the Victoria Falls were virtually dry. Now, they do dry up from time to time, but this was exceptional. But the consequences of that were very clear. There was no water going into Lake Kariba. There was no hydropower being generated for cities like Lusaka. And as a consequence, people were facing 18 hours of power cuts in the big cities, which were dependent on those supplies. Um, what happened then, of course, people had to cook their meals. You can get by without electricity uh, in a hot climate if you, if you don't need air conditioning or you can cope without it. But you have to cook your evening meal. And the only option is your charcoal, which you then buy from the charcoal sellers who deforest the local countryside, who carry wood from anywhere they can into the cities. And of course, for the poor rural uh, individuals, it just means they have to wander further every day in search of enough firewood for their evening meal. But what it brought home to me was that c climate fluctuations have a lot of implications, a lot of impacts that are not obvious to us in the first instance. Now, the kind of uh, problems that, um, <laughs> of course, have been caused have been caused primarily by the changes in the atmospheric loading we now know of the greenhouse gas family. Uh, gases like carbon, carbon dioxide, glass, gases like methane, gases like the nitrogen, diox the nitrogen oxide family. And if we look at how that has changed over time, this kind of dancing graph shows um, basically the measurement of CO2 from the South Pole to the North Pole. This red dot in, in the middle is the main measuring station in the middle of the Pacific and in the Hawaiian Islands. And as you can see, as we move through the years from about 1980, you can see the graph steadily rising there and rising from a starting point around about 335 parts per million uh, in 1980. But as each year progresses, you can see the graph going higher and higher. You also see, um, interestingly enough, a place kick in um, not too far from us here in County Galway, Mace Head, which becomes one of the major measuring stations for carbon dioxide in the world around that time. You can see the way in which it oscillates from summer to winter as the vegetation grows, especially in the northern hemisphere, and takes carbon dioxide out during the summer months, and then the CO2 builds up again when the leaves fall of the trees during the winter months. But you can see, undoubtedly, the way in which the trend uh, is so well established and so clear cut um, as, as that period goes on. Now, of course, when you get to the present, you begin to wonder, well, is that something that's happening only relatively recently, or is it something that we can uh, identify as happening earlier on? And so we go to some of the more early records, um, records which began about 1950, um, again from the Hawaiian Islands. Uh, and you can see, as we push our, our records back here, 
that the trend is confirmed even back to that period of the middle of the, the 20th century. And if you want to push it back even further, of course, there are ingenious ways we can now we measure what the carbon dioxide concentration of the atmosphere was hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. Uh, we can use tree ring analysis. We can measure the bubbles in the ice sheets which have trapped the atmosphere from that time. Uh, we can even put probes into the Egyptian pyramids uh, which have been sealed up for five or 6,000 years. But the, the answer always comes out the same. The answer always comes out that it stabilizes at about 270, 280 parts per million before the Industrial Revolution. And even if you go much, much further back than that, by looking at bubbles in the ice sheets, and we can trace the, we can trace the interglacials and the glacials which have punctuated Earth history all the way back, we can go to about 800,000 years ago. It never exceeds that value of about 280 parts per million, even during the peaks of the interglacials, which occurred at that time. So the message is quite clear. We're now living in an atmosphere which is different and which has been enhanced by human activity um, more so than any time since the past 800,000 years. So it's not surprising that the IPCC can make this kind of a, a confident statement that each of the last three decades has been warmer than the successive decades, that we're looking at probably the warmest 30-year uh, period at the moment, at least of the last 1,400 years, and most importantly, this very headline statement that it's extremely likely that the human influence has been the dominant cause of warming since the middle of the 20th century. Now, that's a statement which, of course, some people would like to challenge, uh, but that's the considered, if, considered opinion of the world's scientists, assembled, reviewed, and peer-reviewed. And I say some people will like to challenge that because, of course, if you look at a trend, you can always pick sections of it which may go the opposite way and, and you will find, for example, that some people think that there was a pause uh, since 1995 uh, and, of course, you can cherry pick a trend uh, to, to get that kind of a, a false or artificial um, uh, trend coming out the other way. But this is what you have to look at. The overall trend is very clear cut uh, as well. Now, why I'm saying this is because misinformation is often given, and it's often um, as a result of an understand a lack of understanding between climate and weather, between a kind of a cold morning like we had today when people might say, what's all this about global warming, uh, which is a complete um, sort of short-term reaction, but it's not to do with how things are changing in the long term. So you have to be very careful when you get media uh, opinions like this, um, which uh, imply that uh, if we have a cold spring or a cold summer, that global warming is all over sort of thing. But you have to be very careful with the tabloid press anyway, as you all know. Um, would you believe, for example, a newspaper headline like this, which says inside it's going to help you to stay healthy and avoid cancer? And to help you do that, it's going to give you a free portion of chips at the same time. Um, so, you know, be, be very cautious is what I'm saying. And that kind of thing does apply even with our, our Irish media as well. Um, you know, you will find uh, correspondents who think, uh, if we have a cold spell, what's all this guff about global warming? Uh, there are also uh, interesting things from uh, Kevin Myers, for example, never short of an opinion, of course, uh, Kevin Myers, but a, a policy sometimes of wrapping up things that are maybe unpopular at the same time and smearing them all at the same, in the same way. Here, he's wrapping up communism, Catholicism, and warmism all in the same sentence and, of course, implying that uh, there's some kind of religious credo attached to scientific interpretations of temperature measurements, which uh, is rather dangerous. And my own favorite here, Ruth Dudley Edwards, a good historian, but certainly not a climatologist, who accuses myself of getting excited in an article and uh, at my stage in life to be accused of getting excited is, I think, a real compliment, uh, which I, I'm very grateful for. Anyway, um, to go back to the, the, the real science, this is how things have been changing. This was the warmest year, as we said, uh, last year on record. Incidentally, it wasn't the warmest year everywhere. It was the hottest year in Europe, but you can see little pieces here uh, in the West, like Ireland, which uh, had a cooler summer, as we all know and remember. So it's not the case that everywhere goes the same direction. 
But nature is telling us that whatever we think about these effects, <coughs> um, nature is telling us that they're underway. And of course, they're, they're underway partly uh, determined by the measurements we make of the, uh, of the ice sheets. For example, we know now that uh, from the fifth assessment report, uh, Greenland is melting a little more quickly than we thought. It's now putting in uh, about uh, 215,000 million tonnes of water into the oceans every year, um, which is about uh, five times, six times more than it was uh, at the, in the last decade of the last century, the 1990s. We know that the Antarctic now is losing, losing ice on balance. We, we thought the Antarctic was quite stable, that uh, it might even be gaining ice as a result of more snowfall. Um, but in fact, we know that it's now adding as well about 150,000 million tonnes per year to the, atmosphere, to the ocean's water supply, again up about five times. But most dramatically, of course, we see the changes in summer sea ice around the, the North Polar regions, where each summer the dwindling sea ice becomes, becomes very marked indeed. And this is the picture, the last picture we have of the, the minimum amount of summer sea ice last year in September. Um, and you could have sailed from, from Galway quite happily round the coast of Siberia last summer all the way to Japan and to China without encountering any ice at all. A very strange and very, very different situation from what normally applied 40, 50 years ago. With a bit of ingenuity, you could also have made the Northwest Passage across the north coast of Canada to California or to Alaska. Um, and uh, again, you could have managed the north, the fabled Northwest Passage, which people, of course, gave their lives trying to, to find. Um, this is uh, Sir John Franklin, who spent his life and a number of voyages trying to find the Northwest Passage um, in the 19th century. Eventually, he perished with 129 of his crew, and when they found the remains, uh, in more recent times, the, the bones had been scratched by metal implements, implying that they had perished and even resorted to cannibalism at the end of the day. But it shows you the lengths which people were going to to find a route which today is largely open. Today, um, you could, for example, sail quite happily, and of course it's opening up economically. Uh, it's opening up for mineral exploration, a very fragile environment, which unfortunately is very susceptible to oil spills or anything going wrong, but it's opening up because it's now so lucrative to sail the Northwest Passage. You can save $300,000 on a single trip going from Europe to China, and it only takes you uh, maybe 20 days to do that. In fact, you can make the whole passage uh, in about eight or nine days uh, through the two straits. That's very lucrative indeed, and it's going to be an issue for the future to, do, to, to think about. So what I'm trying to say is the, the, area of the issue of climate change is largely settled from a scientific point of view of what's been going on in the past. But what about the future? Well, uh, the future depends on how good we are at trying to make scientific projections. And this is Lewis Fry Richardson, who was a Quaker, and he was an ambulance driver during the First World War. We're hearing quite a lot at the moment about the First World War. He had uh, a lot of boredom as an ambulance driver in between the activity on the Western Front. So he set himself a task of trying to work out what the weather would be three days ahead, four days ahead, uh, at a time when there was very little observations and, and a lot less knowledge than we have today. And he had only a slide rule or so to, to use to do it. He got it completely wrong, um, but nevertheless, his principles were right, and he used an interesting term. He said, suppose I had lots and lots of people working, rather like an orchestra, where the woodwind was in this corner and the brass was in this corner, and they were all doing their own little calculations and giving me the final answer, the, the, the conductor, that I would then say what was happening uh, everywhere. And he used the term computers for the first time to describe all of these people who were computing away uh, in the background. Now, those computers, of course, we've now replaced with, with, uh, with real computers, if you like. And we've seen an explosion in the capability of, uh, of computers to handle the complexities of the atmosphere, 
to handle the what-if situations of a chaotic system where you have so many options, one hour ahead, 12 hours ahead, 12 days ahead, that it becomes a really complicated uh, exercise. And we can build up very complex models uh, from that kind of exercise, which gives us an idea of where we're going to go. The input for those models, of course, is really what we're doing to the atmosphere. Are we going to continue along a trend of increasing greenhouse gases um, <coughs> from <coughs> around about today, where we put in about five or six, sorry, about uh, 12,000 uh, million tonnes of, uh, <coughs> of uh, carbon dioxide? Are we going to continue to a picture of uh, maybe 16 or 17 by 20 years' time? <coughs> what we can do with the models, though, quite interestingly, is we can run them with a, an atmosphere with a normal greenhouse gas component and an atmosphere with a, 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 an actual zero greenhouse gas component um, or a natural greenhouse gas component. Um, and when we do that, we, we therefore can say, well, what is the effects of humans as opposed to what are the effects of natural and here we find, of course, that we only get agreement between the observations and um, our projections when we use the, all of those factors, the human factors. If we were to use only natural factors to drive our models, the Earth should be cooling down at the moment. But it's not. And it's only when we build in CO2 and other gases that we get um, the agreement with observations, which gives us confidence that our models may actually be working and working correctly. Now, for the IPCC, then, this is the scenario that's painted uh, for the globe. Um, <coughs> if we don't do anything to arrest our greenhouse gas emissions, uh, you can see uh, a rise in temperature in the next 20 years, effectively of another half degree or so. Uh, only a 50-50 chance of avoiding four degrees of warming, despite what the Paris Agreement is, has been saying. Um, we are on track at the moment for a four degree rise uh, unless we, we achieve fairly substantial reductions and changes in frequency as well. Changes in rainfall, often neglected, especially in the developing world, are going to be very important as well. But I'll come back to some of those again. I want to just mention three very vulnerable places for, uh, for concern. The first, of course, is the semi-arid zones of the, of the world where people depend on a short rainfall season to grow enough crops to tide them over. And if that doesn't happen, uh, then social fabric begins to disintegrate. We've seen it in the Sahel. Uh, we've seen it in, in places like the Horn of Africa. We're seeing it again a bit this year in Ethiopia, places where the dependency is very acute. Secondly, of course, the small island states, among the most vociferous of the uh, negotiators at the various international agreements where hundreds of thousands of people may live uh, within one or two meters of existing sea level um, in, in coral atoll situations. And they are people who face cultural extinction. Some of them already have bought land in nearby islands and are seeking to preserve their culture. But it's not through their actions, of course, that their culture is going to be extinguished. It's ultimately as a result of the actions that we in the developed world do or don't take. And thirdly, the great uh, deltas of the world, where the, ocean, where the rivers bring down sediment to the sea. And that sediment is so heavy, it depresses the crust of the earth when it comes to a full stop, when the river stops flowing uh, as it hits the sea. And that deposition means that those delta regions are often subsiding, and subsiding as sea level, of course, is rising. So the telescoping of events occurs uh, in, in such var marginal situations. A couple of them are very vulnerable indeed. Um, I just want to highlight uh, Bangladesh, for example, here, where the, 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 the great rivers of the Sanpo and the Ganges come together. Um, and that red and yellow that you see there is where the land is only three or four meters above sea level. Um, <coughs> and you may say, well, that's fine, but here's Ireland on the same scale. So you're looking at perhaps an area about the size of Ireland, uh, all of which is less than five meters above sea level. Um, but there's one subtle difference. Here in Ireland, on this island, we have about six million people. Uh, in this country of Bangladesh, uh, we have about 160 million people. So effectively, there is nowhere 
uh, for those people to go in that crowded landscape um, when uh, sea level and storm surges arrive. And of course, sea level doesn't rise gradually. Its, its effects are magnified by punctuations of storm surge. So Bangladesh will lose maybe a quarter of its land, even with a one meter rise in sea level. And that will make the current situation of migrants that we see in the Mediterranean seem very small beer indeed in the years ahead, if and when that happens. Now we're beginning to see some of those extreme events happening already in the developing world. We've seen the most intense cyclone on record, uh, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines uh, a couple of years ago. Um, the devastation of the town of Tacloban that you see here. We've also seen even the developed world beginning to get a taste of some of the extreme events that perhaps it hadn't planned for. Uh, Katrina here, uh, Sandy uh, more recently along the east coast of North America. Uh, and so the developed world as well is beginning to reap some of the, um, reap some of the consequences of, uh, of what it's been doing to the atmosphere. We in Ireland are part of that developed world and our changes are very much in line as a mid-latitude country with what's happening in the world as a whole. So if you were to take the global temperature changes of the past century and a half and look at the Irish temperature changes, they're very much the same. We, we mirror the global average, which is what you'd expect for a mid-latitude country. So no matter where you go in Ireland today, you find that the, you're a half a degree warmer than you were 30 years ago. Whether you're in, uh, whether you're in Belmullet, or whether you're in Shannon, or whether you're in Malinhead, virtually every month of the year is about a half a degree warmer. And that has all sorts of consequences which you'll be noticing in your gardens, in your farms, in your house heatings, and so on. Um, in terms of uh, th that, uh, that's a small change, but that's a change which is going to occur even more rapidly in the next 20 to 40 years. This is some modeling that we've been doing uh, in Maynooth, looking at downscaling the big global models to Ireland, saying, well, what does it mean for Ireland? And what it means effectively is another half a degree or so um, in the course of the next uh, 40 years, 20 to 40 years, both in summer and in winter for most parts of Ireland. Uh, interestingly, for the west of Ireland, um, it'll be a little slower a little less, and that's because of the, the, the impl influence of the ocean offshore here, which s warms and cools much more slowly uh, than the land surface. So uh, you'll perhaps be uh, the last place in Ireland here in the West to experience some of the, the, the more in intense effects of climate change. But the real effect will come not in temperature, because we'd all welcome a half a degree more, I think, in winter and summer in Ireland, but what will happen also is that it will be accompanied by changes in rainfall. And that's where I think the crunch comes for, for Ireland, because the models suggest that all these red areas here will experience significantly more rainfall in the winter time. Um, <coughs> so winter rainfall will increase 10 to 12 percent, perhaps on average, but er erratically. And in summertime, by consequence, the blue areas here are indicating where uh, rainfall decreases will occur in summer. They won't be too marked in the west of Ireland here. They will be certainly much more marked, we suspect, in, in the east. Now, this has two consequences, if you think about it. First of all, it has a, a really serious consequence in terms of flooding and in terms of increased flood frequency and increased flood magnitude in the west of Ireland. But secondly, it is a problem for water supply, for domestic water supply, for fields, for the, even the need for irrigation in some areas of Eastern Ireland in the years ahead. So these are the kind of things that we have to start thinking and planning for, not in 20 years time, but now. And we can see it when we feed in some of these model outputs to stream flow. Uh, and look at how monthly stream flow will change, uh, say in this case in the River Boyne, over the next uh, 60, 70 years. Um, and what you, what you find is a growing problem of winter floods and a growing problem of summer droughts appearing. Um, and those are the twin consequences which really Ireland, I think, we have to think most seriously about. Um, we've seen some of the harbingers of that in some of our major cities, for example, and this is Cork in 2009. But of course, most recently, 
this winter, we've seen uh, around the Shannon especially um, the, the major flooding events that have uh, perhaps, uh, I think, brought home to people for the first time that climate change is something that is, is not uh, something you can kick for touch on for 30 years. And I, I, I got into trouble for describing some of these people as Ireland's first climate change refugees. But in fact, that's what they are, if you think a little about it. Um, <coughs> of course, we have to plan whoops for the future uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of looking at when we need to uh, make additional water supplies to, to individual towns. How, how much time can we buy by conserving water, by fixing leaks? And we can do all of that by our modelling of, of catchment and rainfall now uh, to give people an indication of when investment is really crucial uh, to avoid problems down the road. And we can match it up with population change and so on as well. But we have to remember that we're going to face climate shocks. And we had one, of course, uh, not, too not too far back in terms of the cold spring. We've quite a cool spring this spring as well. Um, but these are the costs of really doing nothing. And, and you know, it's not a one-self event that will, will not happen again. So we have to plan for some of those. Just a very quick word on agriculture because we have... Um, We've done some modelling for every 10 square kilometres in the country with different yield classes for, for grain, for grass, for potatoes. And the maps are horrible, but let me just tell you what they tell us. Um, the lighter the colours, uh, the better uh, the yields become. So, for example, here you can see for... Uh, let me see, this is, this is grain yield. You can see the west of Ireland actually does relatively well um, for wheat for barley in the years ahead. Uh, it has that little extra moisture in the summer that the east will be starved of. So if, of course, the soils permit, and in many cases we know in the west the soils just simply don't permit, uh, agriculture will do actually quite well. Um, the ones that won't do well are things like potatoes, which of course don't like dry summers. So uh, potatoes will be difficult to grow in some parts of Ireland uh, in the decades ahead. And grass will also become more problematical in dry summers. You know how milk yield goes down and how grass yield goes down. So um, again, the west does a little better than the east because of that little extra moisture in the summer that it will enjoy. There are things like planning we have to think about. And, and as Galway expands and heads towards Hedford, you know, the, the idea of, well, are you going to be very cautious about protecting your groundwater? Because as the rainfall increases occur, then the water table rises. And part of the problem of, of last December was that people were walking around in contaminated water from their neighbor's septic tanks. And that's going to be an, a growing problem, which means that we'll have to plan settlement a lot more cautiously in the years ahead um, than we do at the moment. You can see the, the slightly darker colours around Galway here is where the highest septic tank densities occur, and that's where the problems will have to be addressed most closely in terms of the wisdom of adding to the, to the problem in the future. So planning was going to be much more crucial than it is at the moment. And of course, uh, we, we have our lovely landscapes to think about as well. And, and you're all very conscious of the beautiful landscape that you live in. But some of those are threatened. And Anya will say a lot more, I think, about biodiversity. But just to mention <laughs> the problem of dry summers don't do very well for bogs. They don't do very well with sea level rise for salt marshes. For the, the very unique landscapes of County Galway, the Machair uh, of, of the coastal vegetation, um, again, it's not going to be beneficial to have sea level rise swamping that. And especially the high mountains of, of Connemara. Um, species can migrate as the temperature rises. They can migrate uphill to cooler areas to some extent. But when they get to the top of the hill, there's nowhere for them to go, and that's where extinction then sets in. So there are things we have to look at, how we manage the carbon stores of Ireland. We don't manage some of them very well um, at all. And how we manage the future biodiversity. And again, you know, these are some of the species that Anya may talk about as well that are threatened, even species like the salmon, which you don't get too much further south than Ireland and Europe. Uh, species like the curlew, which have an emotional attachment to many people. The cry of the curlew is something that people grow up with, and, and yet it's one where uh, we're facing uh, a decline in many of these species, especially 
uh, you, you know the corn crake is almost gone, but the curlew, for example, is really uh, going down very quickly as well. So some of these problems are part and parcel of climate change. At the same time, as these niches become available, other species will find their way into them, and they're not always, they're not always going to be welcome species. Um, some of them are invasive species which find conditions more to their liking. And this is gunnera, or wild rhubarb, uh, which has run amok in some parts of the west of Ireland, especially in Achill, um, swamping many places as it, as it finds a niche that's suitable for itself. And other pests and diseases which we don't have at the moment are also coming to us from the continent as the continent warms up. This is one we've been looking at in Maynooth called the horse chestnut leaf miner. Um, it looks nice, but it really messes up the chestnut trees and, and eats and burrows into the leaves of the chestnut trees so that um, the, the leaves fall off in, in June and July. Um, and you can't eradicate them uh, anyway easily. You have to burn every leaf on every tree almost. The eradication rate is, is only about 2% successful. And here's where it started life from. It, it was found first way down here in Macedonia in the 1980s. And since that time, it's made its way up through Europe. It's made its way uh, since the turn of the century uh, through England. And by about three, four years ago, it was in Holyhead waiting for the ferry. Uh, to get to get across to Ireland, and in fact, it made it across to Ireland uh, about three years ago. So we're now facing the eastward spread of that. It'll eventually make its way to County Galway in about four or five years' time, and you'll have problems with chestnut trees, just as other species also are moving towards the north as climate changes. Species like the pine processionary moth here, which does damage to pine, pine trees. So a lot of things have to be thought about in the biological world. A lot of planning has to go into our infrastructure for the future. Are we going to build communication lines on exposed locations like this, which have a very short lifetime? Uh, because these are the things which will cost the next generation money uh, to repair. And of course, we talk a lot about the costs of climate change, but the costs of doing nothing are very seldom talked about. Um, this is just a little exercise we did in, in Dublin Bay, where we looked at every house and measured how high it was above sea level, and then asked the question, well, what if we got a flood of two meters, three meters, four meters? How much insurance claims would emerge from that? How much damage costs would there be? And you can see very quickly, uh, for every county, if you add them all up, you, you get to values in the billions very quickly indeed. So the costs of doing nothing are, are very severe. In Galway, just to give you an example uh, here, if you had a two-meter surge, which is not unusual, um, you, know, you would be looking at around 63 million of insurance claims from Galway County and city alone. So we have vulnerability to think about, which is often not really seriously thought about um, in terms of planning ahead. I have a few minutes left, so just say a few words about, um, about the efforts globally to try and tackle the problem. Ban Ki-moon has been one of the most tireless secretary generals, um, and, and when he visited Dublin, uh, he gave us a little uh, warning uh, at that time. He said, you can't be really good on third world development without being really good on climate change as well now. It's not enough to be uh, generous in your, in your, climate, in your development um, policies without tackling climate change. And so he was reflecting a long-term attempt to try and tackle this problem, which goes back a long way and has had a number of roadblocks along the way, such as Copenhagen, which was the first failed attempt in 2009. So when we got to Paris last year, there had been a very careful choreography laid out. Um, it consisted, of course, of Ban Ki-moon bringing the world leaders to New York on a couple of occasions. It consisted of a deal between President Obama and Jinping from China. Uh, it consisted of very excellent stuff being done by Pope Francis in Laudato Si, a document that's really worth reading. Um, it's not theological, it's really good science, it's really good and very readable uh, material. And tireless efforts by the French diplomatic system uh, to try and achieve a deal, which was eventually, uh, as the introductory 
uh, comment from Mary Robinson said, uh, was achieved. So a legally binding framework was achieved. And so people began to sit back on their, on their, uh, on their chairs and think, well, that's fine, we've solved this problem. But in fact, uh, there are difficulties in terms of enforcing the Paris Agreement, and there are a lot of things that were left out of the Paris Agreement. It is, certainly to its credit, uh, very valuable as a first step on the process. But for example, it's not going to solve the 1.5 degree value. It's not going to even solve the 2 degree value without ratcheting up the commitments very considerably. And there is an element of ratcheting up in the Paris Agreement every five years. But you know, it's going to be a little too late in some cases uh, to, actually, uh, to actually do that. And there are weaknesses in that it has left out aviation, it has left out marine emissions, which together account for approximately the combined emissions of Britain and Germany or Britain and Korea. So very considerable, uh, very considerable problems associated. This is the map of blame, map of culpability, and you can see uh, the big countries here um, <laughs> reflected in their area, whoops, in their size, and you can see the, the problems of, of climate change are essentially caused by the North. The victims of climate change don't actually contribute very much to the problem uh, in, the developed, in the underdeveloped world of, of the, the global South. Um, and so the EU has been in the forefront of trying to get cohesion and trying to get commitment among the developed countries to reduce, on a planned way, our emissions down by 80 to 95 percent within the next uh, 35 years or so. The cost of doing that is not going to be huge. The Stern report, for example, estimates you're looking at about 0.1 percent of global GDP per year as the cost of tackling climate change. And that's tiny compared to the potential damage, I think, that we face otherwise. And some countries have been doing some quite cred creditable things in ter terms of tackling that. For example, the UK has a very progressive Climate Change Act, um, and some countries within the UK and uh, the devolved administrations have even been more ambitious. But when you get down to the nitty gritty, uh, you see that there are some countries that are making a much more uh, serious and disproportionate contribution to the problem. Ireland has among the highest greenhouse gas emissions per capita in the world, in the top 10 in the world. Even as a small, I know it's a small country, and certainly our global total is not big, but for individuals, we are bigger by about 50% than the European average. Uh, we are bigger than Germany, we are bigger than France, we are bigger than the UK uh, in terms of our per capita emissions. And that's quite a serious indictment on, on culpability at an individual level, I think, as well. What it means, therefore, is that our attempts to follow the EU's glide path down by 20% uh, by 2020 uh, seems at the moment to be doomed to failure because our projections are increasing greenhouse gas emissions over the next uh, eight years, nine years, rather than a decrease. Um, <laughs> so we're going the wrong direction. And the reason we're going the wrong direction is, is very simple, actually. Well, there are two causes. The first one is we are opting to increase our agricultural emissions uh, as being in the national interest uh, quite substantially over the, next, uh, over the next 10 years with a 50% increase in milk production. Uh, and that means 300,000 more dairy cows. Uh, that's equivalent to 300,000 more cars, roughly. Um, so you can see that there are issues here of national self-interest versus global community good, which we have not yet grasped in Ireland uh, effectively. So it means that vested interest groups are very powerful, and the national self-interest is, is put forward um, uh, in many ways to suit the relative strengths of, of individual lobby groups within countries. In Ireland, for example, we now know that the Climate Change Bill tells us we will have no energy produced from fossil fuels by 2050. We will have no cars or lorries produced uh, running on diesel or petrol by 2050. We will have no uh, burning of fossil fuels like oil and gas in our homes by 2050. So all of our national emissions by 2050 will be going to the sector of agriculture. Now that raises issues, of course, of an ethical nature 
which I think um, you know, we have to seriously have a, a, an informed debate about at a national level. That dichotomy between global community good and national self-interest uh, is, is something that's quite frequently expressed in the political system. And it's expressed very clearly here. I'm not just picking out the Taoiseach here for his comments because it would be the kind of thing that you could pick out from almost any, uh, well, not all, but from most politicians in Ireland. On the left, you can see the kind of statements that you would love to see from a country that's going to assume leadership or going to assume its responsibilities to tackle climate change. They are delightful statements. Um, you know, the hand of the future beckons, the clock is ticking, we have no time to waste. This was on the way to the UN summit um, in September 2014. And yet, three weeks later, on the way to the, Glo on the, way to the Brussels summit, um, the sentiments are very different. Uh, we are not going to get screwed by targets in Ireland. We are not going to get hammered uh, by changing our lifestyles. Um, you know, the, the, this, this sentiment is so contradictory from the previous one that it, it, it shows up that dichotomy very clearly between the intention and the reality. But I don't want to dwell too much on that. We've tried with, with, um, we've tried with bills but the bills are going to be fairly ineffective. But what I do want to show you to finish is the one key outcome of the last IPCC report, because it, to me it encapsulates most of, the, uh, most of the conclusions that I think we have to take on board, and I'll, I'll finish at that. Firstly, this is the cumulative CO2 emissions since the end of the 19th century on this scale. This is the temperature rise that the Earth has seen on this scale, and you can see there's a very clear linear relationship between how much CO2 we have put into the atmosphere historically and how much our temperature has increased, about one degree at the moment for, for, for all of the CO2 we put in, which means that we can push this forward. And we can say, well, if we want to stay within two degrees, how much is our quota, how much is our budget of a greenhouse gas emissions going to be? And that, that becomes a very important guider because it tells us we've got, we've got 790 billion tonnes to burn. And once we burn that, just like the home store and more ad, it's gone. <laughs> it's gone forever. Um, we, can't go any, we face inevitable dangerous climate change above 2 degrees centigrade at that point. The problem is, of course, of that 790 billion, we've burned already 556. So what we have left and what your children and your children's children have left to handle is 234 billion tonnes. Uh, and that 234 billion tonnes is being burned away at the moment by about 11 every year. Now, you can do a very simple division here and it'll tell you very quickly. We've got two decades left to get this problem cracked. After that, um, we face the inevitability of dangerous climate change. And that's why... Mary Robinson is so active at the moment. That's why the concerns about divestment, the concerns about leaving hydrocarbons in the ground is so important at the moment as well. But those are issues I think John and Danya will touch on later on. So, but let me just finish by showing you once again this lady because the decisions that we make as individuals in Ireland are decisions which will affect the, um, the people of the developing world intimately. And I think one of the lessons that we've come out of the last year from Laudato Si in particular has been the conviction that the planet is our homeland effectively and that we have this common home to protect, not just for Ireland, but for the global community as well. So it means that we have to tackle this issue and we have to get real about this issue and we have to think in terms of the next few years and not the next 50 years in terms of actions which actually mean things. So I'll leave it at that just now. Thank you. Um, okay, um, we've got a few minutes to take some questions, but can I ask you to keep them brief, please? And can we have questions that are relevant to the subject? And um, no major um, speeches, please, from the floor. Um, so, just a few minutes then. Um, John here has got the microphone, so if you want to call him if you have something to say. 
What, what effect would the uh, white paper on energy and climate change in Ireland have on your views on the future for Ireland? Yeah, I have to say that the white paper on energy was one of the most positive things that has come out of the past few years. Um, of the sectors that we've been talking about, which have, are creating problems for us at the moment in terms of the non-tradable uh, emissions, in terms of the non-industrial emissions, our big problems are agriculture, transport and energy. Transport has really not grasped the problem at all yet. Um, agriculture is, as I say, going the wrong way. Energy has made great strides. Energy has, um, in Ireland, has, has begun moving in the right direction. And I think in particular, the main aspect of the white paper that's really positive is the idea of energy becoming not necessarily a big centrally generated commodity in the future, but one which has community buy-in and community control. And if you look around Hedford here, for example, you know, it's an ideal place for a community-based energy initiative to succeed. I think we made many mistakes in Ireland with the way, for example, we tried to impose, or people tried to impose wind farms on communities. Um, Buy-in from the local community would have avoided a lot of those problems and made more sensible locations as well. So I think the energy paper has actually gone some way towards helping that. It, it has a long way to go to implementation, and of course, we, we know in Ireland we often have a plan that's not implemented, but I think it, it's been a positive one. It's, it's one of the things that I would actually be, be quite happy with. Okay, well, the, sadly, um, organic farming in Ireland has not taken off um, the way it should have. I, 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 I would have hoped it would have been fostered and encouraged a lot more uh, by central government than it has. Um, you're right. I mean, we've had a succession of very mild winters. We've had a succession of, of rather wet summers, which um, I don't think will last forever. But we've had a sequence of them in the past few years, which has limited the ability, for example, to make hay. Um, it has also been a problem for wildlife in that we, we tend to, and we will tend to get summer downpours when they do occur in the future being more intense. And that can be damaging as well, both for wildlife and birds like the corn crake, as we know, but also for, for, for people trying to harvest uh, crops like hay. So, I think it's, it is going to be a growing problem. As regards sea level, um, it, hasn't, it has risen by about 19 centimetres so far in the last century around Ireland. Um, different parts of Ireland have experienced different sea level rises depending on whether they were under the ice sheet in the past and are still bouncing up or not. Um, but there will be issues around the, the Burren, you're right, because many of the, the, the rivers flow to a, a, a formerly low sea level and they bubble up in Canvara Bay. You can actually see them when the tide is out around uh, Ballyvaughan and around the Canvara Castle, for example, very clearly. And uh, as sea level rises, uh, I don't think that will cause particular problems of, of pushing the water back in or anything like that. Um, but it will certainly accentuate the, the problems of erosion on that limestone cliff area uh, where we'll see the balance being tipped more towards erosion rather than deposition in parts of, of North Clare. And that's a problem that we'll have in many parts of Ireland where when the waves are coming from a slightly higher level, it gives them more energy to attack the coast. 
And so places that were quite stable or, or were building up sand are likely to see more removal taking place than, than in the past. So I think that would be the main thing. But I don't think in the short term the sea level rise around North Clare will be, will be too problematical for you. Many of the cliffs there, of course the cliffs of Moher won't <laughs> feel anything, um, but many of the cliffs there are, are, are only retreating by uh, a centimetre every 1,000 years at the moment. It's hard rock. It's where you get soft sediments coasts that the main problems will be and that's mainly on the east coast of Ireland and the south coast um, where you have sandy glacial deposits which will be very much more vulnerable to increased wave attack in the future. There are some places in Galway for example as well where you have uh, beach environments which will be more exposed as, as well but I think you're, you're okay in Convara Bay for the moment. <laughs> uh, just, just concerning transport, would there be enough possibility of producing electricity in Ireland to, say, power the um, alternative transports, you know, like electric transport, and would it impact the, the CO2 levels? There, there is p certainly enough potential for renewable energy in Ireland to, to meet the demand for uh, electrification of transport. Um, th I don't think there's a problem in that. Um, there is, we've there are some mistakes being made in how electricity is being generated at the moment by biofuels. Um, and, and some biofuels are very, um, I, th I think, unsustainable. For example, in one of our power stations in County Offaly, we're burning pine kernel nuts imported from South Asia or imported from South Africa. And to me, that doesn't make sense, either from the point of view of encouraging deforestation in those third world countries, but also the sheer transport costs involved as well. But I think we have tremendous assets in terms of wind energy in Ireland, which if we use them sensibly, will meet the changes in the future. The most efficient thing we can do to tackle climate change in Ireland is to use energy more effectively in our homes, in our factories, and in our cars. Um, and that's where the biggest bang for our bucks will come for the next 20 to 30 years, by having our homes better insulated, by having our cars made more fuel efficient, by having our factory processes made more fuel efficient. There is the potential, I think, in Ireland for, for achieving that from renewable sources. I don't think we have to think about things like nuclear energy. I don't think we have to think about things like um, large-scale new power stations on fossil fuels. We have a big decision coming up on Money Point. What will replace that? That's going to be a crucially strategic decision that the government will be taking in the next two or three years. But overall, I think um, you know, we, we've had some false starts in wave energy off the west coast, which I think we will eventually solve. We have no tidal opportunities in Ireland, really, apart from Strangford Loch. Um, but we do have enormous assets in terms of both offshore and onshore wind, which we can use and interconnect with the rest of Europe to uh, avoid duplication of systems as well. One, is there one more question? Yeah. Um, can you tell me, you say that agriculture is a, a problem, and I think you're saying dairying, but what would you suggest as the replacement for that problem? I have to say my partner is a dairy farmer, so I'm quite interested. Yeah, I, I think dairying, I mean, I have, I have a great deal of admiration for Ireland's farmers. I think uh, they are great stewards of the landscape. Um, I think what has been happening, though, is, is not that anyone would wish to see the herd being reduced, but it's just this huge expansion of the herd by 300,000 that's going to cause problems down the road. I think I feel every sympathy for farmers who have been encouraged to go into dairying and invest huge amounts of money and equipment and see the milk price fall to, what, 17 cents or something a litre. Yeah. But I think that's part of the problem. I would, uh, the problem with, with Ireland is, is its lack of diversification in farming. Uh, there's so much in the way of pastoral agriculture and grass-based agriculture that I think there are opportunities for, for example, growing more in the way of vegetables and arable crops than we've actually used at the moment. Because we import huge amounts of potatoes to Tesco. We import huge amounts of carrots and we import huge amounts of vegetables which we could grow quite happily within Ireland and I, I think... Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think you've hit the nail on the head that it's, it's, it's the polluter pays principle should not be applied to the farmer, it should be applied to the food companies and the supermarkets. They are getting off scot-free effectively. If you drive your car, you pay a, a, a road tax based on CO2. If you burn oil in your home, you pay a, a tax based on CO2. If you produce an extra 300,000 cows, I don't think the farmer should be taxed, I think it should be the food company that buys the milk from those cows. And there are some huge profits being made at the moment by the supermarkets and by the food companies, which I think um, society uh, is bearing the brunt of. So I, I have every sympathy for you. Yeah. Uh, sorry, just a quick question there from the mic. Um, do you think that within Europe, and especially in Ireland, that science will ever get a voice within the political system? or whether the, the polit politicians will ever listen to science. Because I know it's earlier you said, by 2020 or when you're grass, Ireland's going to have a hard time getting grass, or the gra grass um, supply is going to be a lot harder to produce because of climate change. And at the moment, they're getting the farmers like they did in the 70s and the 80s of mass milk production, and are going to leave them bankrupt because grass is not going to be growing. As easy as it is now. So that's why I'm asking, when is science actually, or the politicians going to listen to the science and the science have input into policy? Well, you know, there's a fundamental problem with scientists here in that they are not advocates for the most part. And, you know, that, that most of my colleagues will work away on a scientific problem, they will write a paper, they will publish a paper because that's what their career advancement is based on but they don't see their role in pushing policy. I don't see my role in pushing policy particularly either. But what I will say certainly is that policy, science should inform policy and politicians should take on board the scientific realities. What we have in Ireland at the moment, however, is exemplified, I think, by the Scientific Advisory Council, which is composed 100% of economists. And you know, the, the, when you look at things through the economic paradigm, you don't necessarily take on board or, or see the scientific implications properly because there are things that you can't measure economically. You can't measure how much would you be hurt if you couldn't go out and walk on the bogs or hear the cry of the curlew again. You can't cost that. And so that's the kind of thing that an economist will never ever be able to bring on board. And I don't know when, what the answer to that is, quite honestly, but I do know that we've, we've reached the stage in Ireland where the economic paradigm is so dominant that you know the realities of everyday life are being lost by it in this area, as far as I can see, unfortunately. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, John. Um,